is Mary Woolley, um, President and CEO of Research America. Thank you for joining us today and for your partnership in the Research America Alliance. If your organization is not a member yet, please join us. My colleague, Anna Platt, would be more than happy to connect with you. So welcome to today's special discussion, which continues our series highlighting our 2022 Advocacy Award honorees. The awards program itself is coming right up two weeks from today. If you haven't registered yet for March 16th, please do so. We'll put a link in the chat. The virtual program is free and open to all, but it does require your registration. We have very much enjoyed the opportunity to hear from our honorees in advance of the event. And today we're delighted to be joined by Dr. Franz Cordova, president of the Science Philanthropy Alliance and Research America's 2022 Jeffrey Bean Foundation Builders of Science Award honoree. She's going to speak to us today about her tenure as director of the National Science Foundation, the role of private philanthropy in medical and other scientific research, and much more. I know you're going to enjoy it. I want to tell you just a few words of uh, biographical background about Dr. Cordova, but I also want to remind you that if you have questions you'd like us to pick up in the Q&A portion, please put those in the Q&A box or in the chat, and we'll get to as many of them as possible. So um, Dr. Cordova, I, currently the CEO of the Science Philanthropy Alliance, has served in five, count them, five presidential administrations, both Democratic and Republican, and is an internationally recognized astrophysicist. Prior to joining the Alliance, Cordova was the 14th director of the National Science Foundation. Before that, um, among other things, she was the only woman to serve as president of Research University, uh, of Purdue University. And she is also the Chancellor Emerita of the University of California, Riverside. Uh, Franz Cordova was NASA's chief scientist earlier in her career, the youngest person and first woman to serve in that role. She received her Bachelor of Arts degree from Stanford University and her PhD in physics from Caltech. So France, my friend, we've known each other for a long time. I'm so pleased uh, that we have this opportunity to chat for a moment. So I wanna start out with um, at least part of the reason that you're going to be receiving this wonderful award recognition with the Jeffrey Bean Foundation Award. And it's about building science. So maybe you could tell us a, a little bit about how you built science when you were at the NSF and other parts of, of your career as well. Great, well, first of all, Mary, let me just thank Research America for uh, not, only for this award, which I really appreciate, but mostly for being Research America, such an absolutely fabulous organization. You've had so much impact on research in general, and particularly in the health sciences. And I just uh, congratulate you, Mary, who, as you said, we've known each other uh, for a long time. Uh, I think most of your viewers don't even know that we were at Stanford University as undergraduates at exactly right. the same time. Uh, so, so thanks very much. So to your question, uh, at the National Science Foundation, I um, it was just feel so privileged to have been uh, a, a part of that tremendous organization. We had uh, a, a really interesting time over my tenure served in uh, two administrations, the, uh, the last uh, half of the Obama administration and the Trump administration. And um, it just found a tremendous support for science in Congress across the aisle. And um, some of the, the things that were highlights were in, in science itself were discoveries actually in my own field of astrophysics that really made worldwide news, discoveries like detecting for the first time gravitational waves on earth 
that uh, literally shake the earth. A very small effect, but with great technology able to, uh, to detect that. And, and that garnered Nobel Prize, uh, prizes for the founders. And, um, and then there was the uh, detection of high energy neutrinos using NSF's uh, ice cube detector at the South Pole and identifying that their source was uh, a very active galaxy far away. And uh, then there was the image of the black hole that, that uh, captured people to such an extent it became a meme in the popular media. So I think science-wise, and, and, and I remember well the, the very first image of the sun from the brand new telescope on uh, Haleakala in, uh, in Hawaii that just is going to transform our understanding of our, our close uh, neighbor that uh, helps give us life, the sun. In advancing technology, I think we made a, a lot of strides there. Our, we developed a strategic initiative of, or framework called the Big Ideas, and several of them were technology related, like our mid-scale uh, research infrastructure, our emphasis on artificial intelligence and on quantum science and technology. And we started something called the Convergence Accelerator, which was a, a very uh, new idea uh, for the public sector, a, a government agency, to put together industry, uh, university, research institute ideas that were pointed towards a really important use and could achieve it quickly. And that laid the foundation for what is now a lot of excitement at the National Science Foundation, which is the um, creation of a new technology directorate. And we're very hopeful that Congress will, um, the House and Senate will get together and, and, and converge on their bills and, and get that technology directorate started. Well, you, you had an enormous impact while you were at NSF, France, and I know you're still uh, strongly connected because um, there are many, in order for success to happen in any of these fields, it takes partnerships, right? And if that brings me to the sometimes underappreciated or not um, considered partnership of philanthropy. And you're, you are, of course, have always been aware of that, close to it, involved in it. But now as the uh, CEO of the Science Philanthropy Alliance are taking an even deeper dive. And people might not know about that alliance. So I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about how it got started and what it does. And since we're Research America with a medical and health focus in particular, any special highlights in that regard? Sure. Well, I, I feel very privileged to get to lead the Science Philanthropy Alliance. It's an uh, alliance of about three dozen foundations, and uh, their mission is to accelerate scientific discovery through visionary philanthropy. And that's really what they're all about, Mary, is increasing the uh, understanding of how important, especially basic research, or emerging uh, scientific research mm -hmm. is in uh, furthering uh, discovery that can be turned into useful applications. And so the uh, foundation was, uh, or the Alliance was uh, started in 2014. So just uh, a few years ago with just six members. And now it has uh, uh, 35 uh, all committed to this mission. It's, uh, it's, it's interesting that you said that um, many people don't know the importance of this sector. So let me just say a couple of words about the, the, the sectors that we do understand well for their contributions to R&D in this country are government, university, and industry. And in fact, in an important group at the National Academy of Sciences is queer, the Government University Industry Research Roundtable. So I am making the case together with our, our foundations that philanthropy, which interestingly for basic research funds over 40% of the uh, research expenditures that universities and research institutions uh, spend every year, over 40% of that comes from philanthropy, which is either direct philanthropy, current philanthropy, or legacy philanthropy. It's mm -hmm. in the endowments of universities and institutes. 
Uh, and so it's, uh, it's, it's, and that profile is really increasing over the past couple of decades, whereas the profile for federal government investment in R&D as a fraction of the total is decreasing. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so, so together, they, they uh, uh, or each of them, it contributes uh, just over 40% to the total, to the total R&D picture for as far as basic research is concerned. So I think it's an enormously important sector. And then too, as you know, well, Mary, uh, philanthropy can it's such a compliment to what the federal government uh, can invest in. It can invest in very high risk and potentially high reward or research, take more risk that um, maybe the government can't or isn't ready to. It can de-risk technologies. And we've seen examples from that in my own field of astrophysics, where maybe there's a big telescope like the Vera Rubin Observatory that's currently being built in Chile that uh, had some mirror technology in the early days that was, oh, really? You know, not sure we can do that. So philanthropists stepped in and paid to uh, de-risk that technology and prove it could be done. And then the federal government stepped in with a lot more money. So very complimentary in that respect. And the other thing that I think is really important is that principally philanthropy funds uh, people. Uh, and uh, not so much project, projects, although they do fund projects, of course, too. But their, their biggest emphasis of uh, the foundations is on people, whereas the biggest emphasis, uh, at least for the National Science Foundation, is on big projects, and that's where they spend their money and need to. Uh, so it's very complementary. And as you've seen, Mary, with the BRAIN initiative, um, uh, that uh, it would be a great example that the partnership of uh, the government and philanthropy is just uh, so important. And I, I found also from doing research on the statistics that actually philanthropy gives more uh, as a fraction of its total investment to the life sciences and biomedical sciences than even the government does. So for the life sciences, it's very important. So about 77% of the money from philanthropy goes in that area. Well, and you've, you know, the very fact I'm getting back to building science, you've helped us understand how philanthropy builds science and builds opportunity for scientists, for people, grants, which is so important. Um, it makes me think in this, it's Women's History Month, right? Yes. That, mm -hmm. uh, and I know what triggered it was when you mentioned the Vera Rubin telescope, you know, named for an extraordinary astrophysicist and and then we have you as as a leader um we i was actually surprised one of my colleagues um showed me some statistics about how uh in 1993 when you were um at nasa only 22 percent of science and engineering jobs were held by women um okay so that was almost three decades ago now we're up to 28 percent which is progress, but it's not really what we're aiming for, right? Um, I wouldn't use the word accelerate on that. <laughs> no, you would not, you would not, that is not particle acceleration or anything else, you know, um, but I wonder if you have any um, thoughts about either what has worked, what you have found that has worked or what the, and or what the philanthropic um, sector is doing to assure that women do have doors opened that in the past, frankly, weren't so much open to them in the STEM fields of building yeah, well, their careers. Well, you, you and I and just so many others, Mary, have been so committed to this issue for such a long time. And I remember back in our Stanford days, there, there were only two women and the entire engineering class at, at Stanford. <laughs> I mean, and but today there are many, and I, I really am. I know that that it's you know it's still uh, there there there's growth overall, and so the growth in women is still a, a smaller. Uh, it's, it doesn't look like a big fraction, but uh, but overall the awards going to women, the number of women in science and engineering uh, and in the health sciences and medicine is is just 
huge compared to those, uh, those very early days. And now there are many, many role models on one's campuses and people that you can go and talk to. And that's just so important for, uh, for encouragement and, and just being engaged because everybody, a male or female has those moments when you just feel very discouraged and, and there are many different directions you can go and you don't know which one to choose and, uh, and you're, you're afraid of making the wrong choice. And it's so important to be able to have people that you can, that you trust and you can go to it and, and, mm -hmm. and have confidence in, in their direction. So, so things are changing. Um, one of the most important things that, that I just see a lot of women doing is uh, engaging in the conversations and the conferences and the talks and, the, and on, on the campuses and, uh, and, and trying to uh, be not just role models, but to really provide some helpful advice. So I know on the, uh, I serve on the Caltech's board of trustees mm -hmm. and they're the, the women on the board decided we wanted to do something for the, for the students. So we just held a little mini conference, which the university helped us organize. And, um, and all, all the women kind of gathered around virtually. This was during the, you know, the big bright COVID days uh, just uh, recently. Right. And, um, and we had a wonderful engaging conversation from these very uh, creative, smart young women over what, what can I do to better position myself? They, they asked all sorts of really interesting questions that you can't unless you feel comfortable with the people you're talking with. And we ha had just a wonderful conversation. So I, I think keeping up that and, and the prizes that are going to, to women are just very important, Mary, as role models, as you know. And then I, I do want to mention one thing that I think was, was really important that we did at the National Science Foundation. And it's been so helpful in my current job as foundations come to me and they ask how we did it. And that's that we, we thought the, the other side of trying to get more women into STEM is to keep them from leaving STEM, okay? Yes, yes. To identify the barriers, because there are a lot of people that will start a show in interest, like I did on my first day of Stanford is to go to uh, some physics classes. And then I thought, mm, you know, maybe this wasn't for me. There weren't any other women in the class and I would do something else instead. And only later came into the field. But what, what we thought was one of the greatest barriers was just the, uh, the, the harassment that uh, women, some women were really feeling in their research groups. And there were many reports of that in the uh, news media. And so we uh, had a, a big powwow at uh, NSF and there all the leadership convened. It wasn't just the office of the director or the office of diversity and inclusion. It was the entire, all the direct, uh, science and engineering directorates. And, and we decided that what was something that we, we could do that was more than just saying, everybody, you need to behave, because we had already done that. We had done that a couple of years ago and it wasn't working. And so we decided we could actually change the terms and conditions of our grants. And so that's what we did. And to hold PIs, co-PIs accountable. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I think uh, actions like that, and that that made a difference, a ripple throughout. NASA was very much on board with that. NIH had lots of talks with Francis Collins about that, who yeah. also did a lot of significant things mm -hmm. at NIH. Mm -hmm. So so I think it's it's about encouraging and, uh, and it's also about not discouraging women. And, and, and I think the numbers, Obviously, they have changed, and I I have hopes that they'll that that first derivative will change too and increase. Well, I, I think it is. I agree with you that it is changing, and it it's it's going to take more leaders, people like you, who are willing to step up and, in, in my opinion, and demand accountability, you know, rather than assume that uh, people will um, do the right thing if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, old habits die hard, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to go back to leadership because I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, many of our viewers will be interested in your thoughts about leadership. So you went from practicing science, which you continue to do for some time, and then into leadership 
roles. How did how did that happen? Is this something you had your um, goal, your mind set on? You wanted to become a leader, and what did you learn along the way? Well, actually, out? Mary, I. I, I didn't have my mind set on that. I, I was very happy in, in the laboratory. And my laboratory was the cosmos. And it's very inspiring. <laughs> I'm, I'm so glad I, 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 I live in uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico. And I can really see the night sky. And I can see the Milky Way and just so many stars. And it still inspires me as it did when I was a very young girl. So I would have been very happy. And in fact, I turned down at a young age, I turned down opportunities to go in different directions from um, basic research because I, I had worked so hard to change from being an English major and working for the LA Times to um, as a journalist to, um, to doing research and to getting my PhD at Caltech. And so, so I, was, I was committed to that. And it, it wasn't until I um, uh, had worked in it for some time that the people whose paths I had crossed asked me to, to step up and to, to do some things that were different and a little bit outside of that space. And so the first one was my thesis advisor who had gone from Caltech to um, Penn State University. And he asked me to come and be the department head at Penn State. And I thought, well, it is an entry into the university world and being around students and all. So I took it and, uh, and I could still do my research and I did. And, um, and then, uh, and then the, the, but the really changing moment was you mentioned that I went to work for NASA uh, as chief scientist. <clears throat> so when the head of NASA, Dan Golden called me and asked me to be, uh, <clears throat> uh, if I would interview and, and then offered me the position, uh, that that was the defining moment that took me from uh, you know being a research scientist into the policy world, and I, I didn't I didn't have any idea what policy was about at the time. It was just a complete surprise to me. But but when I talked to people about taking the job, the point that they made was how can you get on a stage and say how important it is for women to be in science and engineering and medicine. And then when you're offered an opportunity, not take a bigger stage to be able to, to be a role model and to talk about how important that was. And so that made sense to me. And the leading proponent of that view was my mother. <laughs> Who is, you know, your mom knows you best. And so, so I thought, well, it's for three years. Okay, you know, I'll, I'll do it. I, I, I did it as a... Uh, on one of those IPA uh, agreements uh, as a rotator. And so I, I went to NASA and did that. And then, then people were offering me positions as vice chancellor for research, as dean of research, that sort of thing. And so, so but, but I was committed to the policy world. And, um, and, and so doing those kind of, uh, that kind of a job at a university, I went to UC Santa Barbara, amazing physics department, et cetera, Santa Barbara research there. And, and so that's how I got, I got into it, Mary. It's very interesting what I tell young people is sometimes there are things in yourself that you don't recognize, things about that other people see by the way that you participate and engage. Mm -hmm. And maybe you, you didn't even know that, that those were out there as possible job choices, but they see that in you. And they, they are thinking about a job. We have this opening for chief scientists. You know, we want to change up who, who, you know, what the face of that looks like. You know, I'm going to ask France to do that. I'm going to ask her to be the department head. Um, and, and so that, that's a point where I think you need to be receptive, uh, at least somewhat receptive and think, why are they asking me to do that? Because they clearly think that I can. And even though I had never thought that I could, I had never aspired to do that kind of job. I thought, well, you know, maybe, maybe there's something in that and, and I'll just dip my toe in the water. So that's how I went into leadership positions. It was not, not kicking and screaming for sure, but it was also <laughs> not having that, not imagining every night before I went to bed, oh, I want to be a leader. It was, it was just people approaching me and saying, you know, think seriously about this. This, this looks like it could be a good fit. Well, that's just a, it's a wonderful 
um, story, you know, truth. Uh, and to me, it's about mentorship as well as as uh, listening, you know, and whether those those people were mentors or became mentors or so forth. I think is we've found um, overall that that role is incredibly important to everyone, but I'd say especially to women, to help them take next steps and and be in a, a, a safe environment as they speak to their mentor, maybe mentors, you know, just really, I'm sure you can think back on people in your career who were extraordinary, extraordinarily helpful to you. And um, I can as well, you know, and some, including some we didn't expect, you know, so that's a good thing too. So, I also think it's important to realize that mentors are not only people who have bigger jobs than you do, uh, mm -hmm. but but people on your staff, I, I've always thought some of my best mentorships have come from the people that I work with that work for me. Uh, right. They were just right. great role models for certain kinds of skill sets, ways of uh, uh, treating people, uh, being with people, and and really made me pay attention and listen. And, and I think if we're going to grow to really fulfill everything that we are, that, that there are a lot of kind of personal characteristics mm -hmm. that we also need mm -hmm. to learn as we grow in, in mm -hmm. these jobs. It's not all about taking a bigger job and more responsibility yeah. and more activity. It's about being a better person and that kind of mentorship I've gotten from people all around me. Well, it's beautifully said. Um, I salute that. I. Um, Time is flying a bit here, Fran. So uh, I want to check in with uh, my colleague Anna to see if we have any questions from our viewers. Um, give give you a chance, Anna. Um, sure, absolutely. Got something for us? Okay. Yes, we, we have questions coming in quickly, Dr. Cordova. Um, so as you and Mary were just talking about mentors, you know, and and mentorship, would you be able to share a bit more information about who your mentors have been throughout your career? And another question is, what advice do you have for people on mentoring the next generation of those interested in STEM and science? Sure. Well, it, it, it's it, it fascinating to me that mentorship has become even more important in a visible sense today than it was. It's always been important, but, but people haven't often uh, always uh, historically recognized how important it is. And so I really commend, especially the young people. And we have some young people in our foundations that are part of the Science Philanthropy Alliance that are just totally dedicated to doing more for mentorship. So I, I wanted to say that. Mo most of my mentors have been guys, not all of them, but a lot of men, because that's I've just been in environments where I've been the only woman or one of few. And so uh, I, I always, when I talk with groups of students, graduate students, postdocs, uh, and uh, we hear about issues that are going on with their campuses, the research labs, I uh, often turn to the guys and say, you can help with that. <laughs> You, know, you get on board with your your women friends and make a big pitch for that. Uh, but but I've had a tr tremendous mentorship from uh, from from men who just thought that that I could do something and opened uh, a lot of lot of doors. Um, so as far as mentorship itself is concerned, there there are just so many so many ways to do that. I think people underestimate how just. Your, your daily life and activities, what you do in your workspace, what you do in your home space, and all those clubs and organizations that you belong to, how you can conduct yourself and, and, and treat other people and interact with them is so incredibly important in, in mentorship. It in, encourages people, it brings people in. For example, when I'm at, at the table with a lot of people and I see that just two or three people are speaking because, you know, they're, you know, they're on the Myers-Briggs spectrum, they're way over there and, you know, there's a whole lot of people on the other end, then I, I just 
try to bring them in and say, oh, you know, I think so-and-so has, you know, looks like she's about to put her hand up or, you know, we, there's a few people we haven't heard from. So let's, let's just go around the table and hear from there. And the, then profound ideas emerge, you know, who, who would know because they just weren't the first to uh, raise their hand and uh, feel comfortable in, engaging. So there are so many little things we can do. I, I, I don't think we can overestimate how important just the, the smaller actions in our everyday life are to, um, to mentorship. You know, I have to jump in on that. I, I love what you say, France, because I think what one of the many ways they uh, distinguish you as um, our honoree as a builder of science, but just in the general community, I know this from being out there, is your attention to everybody and things big and small. And just a, that reinforcement that you're providing now for uh, paying attention, giving people space to contribute, for example, and, and learning from those who are um, uh, younger generations and, uh, you know, as well as your peers and those um, in, in older generations, all, th all three, all the time, I think, is something that I've watched you do and I personally value and have learned from. So I, Thank um, you. I salute you. That's an important way to build science. It really is. Yeah. Absolutely. So, yeah. Anna, do you have um, any other questions there? Yes, absolutely, I do. Um, so Dr. Cordova, this person is asking, at this time of global conflict, what's your view on the role and the potential impact of science diplomacy? Oh, that's such an incredibly important question. Yeah. Diplomacy, period, <laughs> a great thing. Uh, and uh, as, as uh, scientists, we have, a, we have a special opportunity and uh, a, a lot of us have been working for a very, very long time internationally. We can't imagine our fields without an all international contribution. You know, I, I mentioned just uh, at the beginning of my remarks, a couple of science uh, highlights. I mean, they're, they're more than just highlights. They made worldwide news that happened when I was at NSF, like uh, the, the LIGO facility uh, detecting uh, gravitational waves. Well, that, those, that particular observation, as well as imaging the black hole and, and the neutrino experiment, none of those headliners could have been done without international engagement. And it wasn't superficial international engagement. It was absolutely integral to the success, to the scientific success. And um, we, you know, in my field alone, we have most of our glass, we call it our telescope mirrors, are uh, in other countries because in the, from the Southern Hemisphere, we're, we're not, we don't, you know, have uh, territory there. So we, we really uh, take advantage of our collaborations there. But in, in so many fields, I'm presently re reading Walter Isaacson's uh, wonderful book, The Codebreaker, and, um, and, and just how important in the whole field of, uh, of genetics uh, and, and all the discoveries that went on with uh, CRISPR and the various enzymes like Cas9, that it was just the international collaboration that really made it so, uh, just in incredibly diverse teams of scientists. So uh, on the diplomacy end, I found that it's, it's just, uh, I mean, doing science is just such an important, important part of the diplomacy because you have to make things work and they work through national or international organizations and their leadership. When, when I was at the last foreign trip we made when I was at NSF was to Chile. And we, we, we not only visited the, the telescopes with our board members of the National Science Board, but we visited in the office of the president of the country, was very, very committed to what the US was doing there and that engagement. Same thing with Ireland, same thing with so many other countries. And one of the other things I'll mention is that my predecessor at NSF, Subra Suresh, started the Global um, Research Council, 
uh, which is about 60 and more other countries that all have their research institutions getting together every year and, and talking about principles, principles for everything from merit review to women in science to so many different important issues. And I think that was a real diplomacy tool that, that got us right up there into the government of all these countries and all working together on things that are, are, are shared values for science. You know, I, I really love the way you fra frame that with shared values, France, you know, and I, I uh, kind of in that, using that as a segue, you know, we all, or many of us listened to the State of the Union address last night, and we heard, among other things, the president talk about um, a unity agenda, unifying, and one of the aspects of that was doing more for mental health. And that's, um, you know, there's a parity aspect to that for sure, which goes to some of what you've just been saying. But there, I know there is a feeling in our uh, medical and health research community that not enough has been committed, including by the philanthropic community, to uh, by philanthropists to help advance brain science. Do you hear about that in? in discussions in the Science Philanthropy Alliance? Does it come through? And is there a way for people who might be interested in, in advancing it to um, make the case to your alliance? I, I, I think definitely, uh, as I said, a huge proportion of the philanthropic research goes towards the life sciences and medicine. Yeah. And yes, there is uh, uh, much research connected with um, uh, mental health and and the other attributes of the brain, Alzheimer's and so forth, other diseases. So I think that there really is opportunity there. And you know the other community, I I have my foot in every community right now, but uh, another community is of course universities, and I I just mm -hmm. can't uh, move away from this uh, conversation, this thread, without just saying how important and how much the whole question of mental health is evolving on the campuses and how big the needs are. And the yeah. campus leadership is really uh, now devoted to increasing the resources. And so that's a place where uh, everybody can help out, including philanthropic uh, resources for mental health. I think all of us, I'd, I'd be surprised if there were anyone that hadn't at some time gone to their campus counselor. I know I certainly went when I would break up with somebody or whatever and say, help, you know, what, what advice do you have? I mean, those are just so uh, such essential part of growing up, leaving home and then making the transition into the adult world of work and everything. And so I'm, I, I think that there are lots of places where one can invest in mental health, but certainly our college campuses, and, and we've seen the mm -hmm. tragedies that occur when, when there's, you know, not quite enough a, attention there. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, Anna, we're, we're getting close to our time, but uh, you might have one or maybe two that we can squeeze in here. Yes, we will, we will do our best for sure. Uh, Dr. Cordova, another question that has come in, have you seen any shifts in philanthropic investment in research or trends uh, that have arisen in the past few years as a result of the pandemic or perhaps for, from another uh, issue that's come up? Oh, tre tremendous mm -hmm. shift uh, mm -hmm. as, as one would expect in, uh, because of the, the pandemic. Uh, just a uh, uh, huge amount of activity and um, philanthropy going towards, I mean, everybody, you know, just, kind of stopped in their tracks no matter what they were doing and really, really focused on this issue. And I hope that it set the stage, I, I know it has with a lot of philanthropies for the next pandemic and how we can address uh, uh, what, what are the causes and, uh, and identifying um, uh, disease as it emerges a, a lot more quickly. So uh, let me just give one example there. And last year, the end of last year, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation joined the Alliance. They, they had been working with the Alliance for some time, but they joined as members. And um, one of their leaders talked about uh, at our last members meeting about uh, her, 
her work in, in Africa uh, to, um, to educate people to be able uh, to, in little you know, camps all over uh, different countries, to be able to do the, the research and the work with, uh, with the people uh, living there on identifying when the next emerging virus would occur and what it looks like. And they're not only working on that, but on, on HIV, of course, there's a lot of emphasis of the Gates Foundation and others on, on HIV. But in situ, and going back to our international discussion, there, there is a, a lot of uh, interest in, in teaching and training people how to be doing this work uh, all over the, these countries that are so uh, afflicted in a huge sense by disease. So um, yeah, a lot of, lot of effort there. And also uh, I would just point people on sciencephilanthropyalliance.org. There are about a dozen of uh, stories uh, that are deeply researched. We call them prequels, mm -hmm. very well-written stories mm -hmm. uh, for COVID on how uh, the, the tools that were used in COVID for, for treatment uh, came from basic research. And so um, I was just talking about it with, um, with Harvey Feinberg earlier this morning about the, the PCR a technique that goes into, uh, that's amplifying the little tiny bits of DNA uh, by polymerase uh, chain reaction that goes into the COVID test so that, uh, that you have just a teeny sample then becomes much larger and you can identify whether a person has COVID or not when they do those nose swabs. That, but, uh, and, and all that goes back to thermophilic bacteria in, um, in the uh, hot, uh, hot pools in Yellowstone Park and the identification of how uh, bacteria can live in such warm environments. And that has a long, long history of research that just that then evolved into us it being able to take these tests so quickly and find out if we have COVID or not. So there are a lot of those kinds of stories that are detailed there. Uh, and uh, one can learn a lot about the progress of science that has helped us so much in the last couple of years. So you, you know, uh, France, when you talk about the um, stories of science, you, you're, you're, it's just palpable how excited it makes you and other people. Um, and as we all collectively as a community face um, many signs of declining public trust in science. You know, I, I think we need a lot more people like you who have not only been builders of science and you will continue to be, but are also advocates for science. And that, uh, that word doesn't have to have a capital A on it. It's, to, but I think it's, I think it's in your DNA. And one of many reasons that uh, we've had a great bond over the years. And I look forward to that and continuing and to um, our upcoming opportunity to um, honor you as one a most deserving recipient of the Jeffrey Bean Foundation Award for Builders of Science. Well, thank so you very much. Coming right up, and I want to um, just remind everybody all over again to join us on March 16th. And, and now we thank you, France. Um, thanks for your time today and for your entire career to date and everything that's coming next. Bravo, bravo. Thank um, you. I, I have one quick announcement before um, everybody signs off, which is to invite you to be with us uh, next Wednesday. Uh, March 9th at two o'clock Eastern, when Dario, Dario Gill, the Senior Vice President and Director of Research at IBM, is going to speak to us about quantum computing in medical research and development, ethical issues regarding neurotechnology, and the protection of personal medical data. You will not want to miss this. Uh, there's a link in the chat right now to where you can register Please don't miss it and have a great rest of your day. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye, Mary. Thank you. Bye bye, France. You're the best. <laughs>